Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. All right. Open your Bibles, if you will. Let's go ahead to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to pick up with our, our last uh, time together. Talking about being overcomers. And uh, we were about to get into the kind of final point. I may have even brushed into it a little bit, but that wasn't, you know. Um, overcomers. We need to be overcomers. We triumph as believers through faith. We read from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. This is our foundation text. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And in case you're wondering, that's where our church name came from. All right, 1 John 5, 4. Faith and Victory Church. Uh, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Okay? So, you know, you've got to be a believer for your faith to work. You can't... Faith works for believers. Bible faith works for believers. Unbelievers, get saved faith works. That's all it works. Believe on Jesus and get saved. That's what works. Okay? Okay. Now... We talked about last week that we're born to be overcomers. We're born of God. We're born to be overcomers. We talked about we're overcome because Jesus overcame for us, and he is in us. Okay, so Jesus overcame for us, and he is in us. So he is, he has overcome the Satan. Remember, he, he stripped him of his rights. He stripped himself of his rights to deity and to glory and became a man, walked among us as a man anointed by the Holy Ghost. And he, listen, he was still God. But he did not use his deity when he was walking the earth. He used being a man under the covenant. Okay? The Bible refers to him as the man, Christ Jesus. Not that he wasn't God, but it's how he walked on the earth. Had he walked on the earth as God, we couldn't emulate him. Okay? He came to show us how to do it, how to live by faith, and how to get it done. Didn't mean he wasn't God. It means he, he did not use his deity to do the things he did. I mean, he could have just looked at said, I'm God, go. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't. He said, it's written. And everywhere that Satan attempted him, he said, it is written. Okay? And so he had, why? Because if he didn't overcome through the word in the flesh, then we couldn't. He came to do and show us how to win. And he did it by living in the flesh, living by faith, and overcoming the enemy. Okay? All right. So he overcame for us. Hallelujah. Um we, and we talk about how we're more than conquerors. Let's move over now to, Re, to Revelation chapter 12. How do we overcome? We overcome according to Revelation chapter 12. We'll read from right there. Verses 11, or 9 through 11. And it says, And a great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then we know from other scripture, about a third of, of the angels were cast out with Satan. Okay? They were cast out with Satan. All right. And, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God night or day and night. And this is verse 11. Here's where. And they overcame him, that is the devil, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. So here we have the, the, the two-pronged the two thing. Number one, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Two, by the word of their testimony. Now, let me say this. The blood of the Lamb becomes ineffective or not applicable or workable in your life unless you've got the word of your testimony. That's what puts it into force. Okay, without the, you know, now, your word without the blood is, has no power behind it. The power of the blood doesn't go into operation without the testimony or the confession. So your testimony is your confession of faith. Okay? Let's look over, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 9. I would say my favorite book in the Bible. Chapter, my favorite chapter is Hebrews chapter 9. I just love this chapter. And we'll pick up around verse 11. You know what? We'll just pick up in verse 1. How about that? Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and the worldly sanctuary. 
For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censure and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, where was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. You know, where God in, comes out and says Moses and cuts, his, you know, writes on, you know, you saw the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Pretty cool movie, I mean, for, especially for its day. All right. And it was overlaid uh, over it with the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. There, there are things about that that we can't, even in this stage, we can't understand until we get to heaven and see it. There's just going to be some things you won't understand. That's why it's called the walk of faith. I mean, there's, there's, there's some spiritual things we just don't get. Okay? And he said, I can't even talk about it. Now, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. Now, some people say they don't believe. I believe Paul did because I believe it fulfills the Pauline Revelation. It's the conclusion of the Pauline Revelation. And there are other scholars who believe that it was, a, it was an addendum to Galatians. That it was sent to Galatia. And then there was a letter. And there, was a, there, was, there was this book and to the Hebrews as an addendum to, to talk about the Jewish culture or the Jewish religion in light of redemption. Okay? Um, there are those who say, no, it was just a different letter. It was written to the Hebrews. Now, remember, if you study your history, you'll find that Galatia was a circular letter. It wasn't just written to the region of Galatia. It was kind of like a letter and to the blank, and they just filled in their name, and it went all over that circuit in that region of the world. So that would make a lot of sense that if Galatia, the book of Galatians was a circular letter to all the churches in, that, in those areas, not just the church at Galatia, and then there was an addendum to, it, to all the Hebrews living in those areas, okay? And to the Hebrews. So the Hebrews kind of like uh, was headed like, and to the Hebrews. That's why when Paul said in the book of Galatians, he said, see how large a letter I write? The bozos come along and say it was because he had ophthalmia, had that pussy oriental eye disease, and he couldn't see. He had to write in real, like one, pe one letter per page to write and all this kind of stuff. Well, the fact is Paul never wrote his own letters anyway. He had a scribe. So that, that stupid theory went out the window. But adding Hebrews to it, as an addendum, then that really makes it sound like it's a, it's a big letter. See how large a letter I write. Okay. All right. Now, you know, all this is, you know, we've got, we got different camps, different theories. I ascribe to that one more than anything else I've ever heard. It makes more sense than anything else I've ever heard. Uh, you know, instead of the suffering bozos. Anyway. <laughs> now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests were always went into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, what is that, the Holy of Holies, went the high priest alone every year, not without blood, for he offered uh, for himself and for the errors of the people. Now, remember, there was, a, there was the veil that was six inches thick, uh, 40 foot high, 60 foot wide, six inch thick of woven material. Now, you just don't, you don't even pick that up. You don't walk over there and just lift that up and go walk in. So the, the, the Jewish belief is he would walk up to it and be trans, trans whatever uh, um, Star Trek in <laughs> you know just pass through it supernaturally and they would tie a rope to his foot and that, there was a pomegranate in the bell a pomegranate in the bell on, so as he's doing his priestly service you could hear him ching 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 line, and the rope was if he, if he wasn't right with God when he got in there and didn't do it right he would die which would happen and they, could drag, they could pull him out and then pull him under yeah get him back out okay alright so he went in uh, to the holy of all, but in the second went the high priest alone. Now remember, the, all these things are symbolic or allegorical. See, no one but the high priest of, uh, that, that was uh, able to go into the heavenly holy of holies could go in. No, you just couldn't have somebody go in and offer blood on that mercy seat. It had to be the high priest, the one who was after the order of Melchizedek and not after the order of Aaron. Okay, and um, you, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sin errors of the people. The Holy Ghost sig thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet manifest while as the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect or pure. Now, this, isn't, this particular thing does not mean um, mature. It does mean perfect. Okay, the, the context here as pertaining to what? the conscience. See, they would get covered over for a year. Their sins for the past year were pushed off. And all the preceding years was pushed off for another year. And then when, when Passover came back around, they did it all over again. Everything got pushed off another year. But there's one thing they never got rid of. They always remembered they were sinful. They were always conscientious of the fact that they were sinful. 
And that, those, those sacrifices with the high priest going in and all the things they were doing and offering the lambs and all the wave offerings and the trespass offerings and the sin offerings and, you know, the, uh, all those different offerings they were offering up. But then at, at Passover, they had to offer the sacrificial lamb. Now, remember, the priest would lay his hands on the scapegoat, confess all the sins on the people, and that was sent out into the wilderness to be judged of God. And then they went in and offered the, the sacrifice on, and put, took the blood to the mercy seat. Okay? But it was all repeated year after year, after year, after year, after year. Why? Because this could not make them perfect or pure or cleanse according to the conscience. They still remembered they were sinful. Okay? Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. But Christ, that is the anointed one who came with the anointing to destroy the yoke and remove the burdens, being high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, or not earthly, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Oh, glory be to God. What does that mean? I don't have to go back next year and get everything I did in the past pushed off another year again hallelujah <laughs> Woo, glory i said glory <clears throat> i don't have to revisit and listen if we had to do it right we all have to fly to jerusalem i mean you talk about a pilgrimage the whole world whole christian world showing up at jerusalem every year during passover to run in and buy your lamb and have an offer to get everything pushed off another year now el al would be rich eric <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the Jewish airline. Okay? Um, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, um, of the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Now, they stop. That could cover your flesh for another year. Wow. Innocent animals... The, the power was in that sacrifice to cover you, cover you. That is where the word atonement comes from. Now, I know it's used one time in the Greek New Testament, uh, in the New Testament, but it wasn't the Greek translation. It's mistranslated, okay? As a matter of fact, I believe what the word atonement used is paschal, which means Passover, okay? We have the, and so the King James uses the word atonement um, one time, but it's a mistranslation. I say mistranslation. They just chose to use that word instead of using Passover. It is, in the Greek, is Paschal, which is where we get the word Passover from, okay? And so we have here, he says, he, that the blood of bulls and of goats and the sprinkling of an ashes of a heifer sanctified, uh, uh, on the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Now think about the fact that God put off all sin and all trespass and on everybody who went and had their sacrifices offered and then the sacrifice of the scapegoat and the sacrificial lamb at Passover for the whole nation for a whole year of everything that ever happened before was put off a whole nother year. And that was called atoning or atonement, a covering. I'm so glad I'm not just covered anymore. <laughs> oh, glory. Hallelujah. See, there, they just got covered up. See, they still knew it was there. It's kind of like, you know, a number of years ago, uh, I guess I was about 14. So we're trying to sell our house in, in Aiden. My parents were trying to sell their house. And we had the galley kitchen. That was, was one of the houses, you know, you, you went down and you had the straight kitchen. The oven and stuff was at the end. Kitchen sink was over here. Refrigerator was over there. And we used to put our hands on the counter and just swing back and forth all the time playing, you know. We just, it was just it was kind of fun because you could reach both sides and just, it was a way to swing, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, somebody came to look at the house. And there was all these dishes in the sink. And I didn't have time to clean it. I suppose I've already done it, but I didn't. You know how kids are. So where'd they go? I'm thinking, baby, I got that one. I covered that one. <laughs> and they walked in. And they, they got to laughing because they looked. And you could see. I mean, you, see, when I was doing it, you, could, you didn't know it. But when I, you backed up, you could see through the door. They were all sitting there in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's like taking a pile of clothes or something. Somebody's coming over. You throw a blanket over them. Well, you can't see the clothes, but they're still there. They're just covered over. And see, when you, under the old covenant, your sins were there. But they were stacked over here and covered for a year. Now, if you didn't get them, if you didn't go back next year, they got uncovered. Okay? So they were, so they were atoned. They were covered. It was the day of atonement. 
the day of covering. And I'm thankful, you know, that the Jews were able to do that until Jesus got here. But then look what it says here in verse this, this, this verse. For if the bowl of blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sanctifieth the unclean, I mean purifying, ashes sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. This is this. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now, now we don't have a pile covered up. They're gone. I said they're not cut. Though your sins be red as scarlet, I'll make them white as wool. I will, I'll remove your iniquities from you far as the east is from the west. Glory to God. He, God says, I will not remember your sin anymore. Praise God. So it's no longer just atoned for. See, we now, see the, the new birth and the, Christian, and, and the new covenant church is not a church or an assembly of the atoned. It is the assembly of the redeemed, purchased back, redeemed from that. It no longer exists, glory to God. It no lo That's why when the accuser of the brethren show up and said, Cook did such and such on such and such date, God says, well, it ain't in the book. <clears throat> and the devil says, I was there. Nope. Sorry. Cook got saved. Amen. The blood of Jesus, hallelujah, didn't just purge him or cleanse his flesh from unrighteousness. It purged his conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hallelujah. It's not covered up. It's wiped out. Glory to God. Amen. Go to Colossians chapter. Hold your finger right here and run over to Colossians chapter 2 real quick. Verse 13, and you being dead and your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened. Now quickened is an old King Jimmy word for made alive. He made alive together with him, having forgiven you all, you all trespasses, blotting out. He didn't cover it up, he blotted it out. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. Jesus didn't just leave it covered up with a blanket of until next year. He just didn't take the atonement blanket and he'd take your sin and cover it up. He came in and where all the record books were, he came in with his blood and blotted it out. It's not readable. It's been redacted from your record Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Satan can say, I was there all I want. He can try to pull up video footage of it. But I am telling you, God's record book says it did not happen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, how far is the east of showing the west? Well, on a number line, they never meet. I think, I think of the, you know, now on the earth we're round, and so they, they, they just, you know, but, but, but that's not how God, he removes them as far as the east is from the west. If you take a zero, and you start counting that way, and you take a negative one and start counting that way, they never intersect. They are infinite in those directions. And that is as far as the east is from the west. There is no pile of your past covered in atonement, waiting for next year's assignment, I mean, next year's sacrificial services to be done to push it off another year. He came and he blotted it out. He took it away from us and took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. Amen. Hallelujah. It ain't there anymore. Somebody shout glory. glory. How to, it's been a long week. Shout double glory. Glory, glory. glory, glory. That's right. glory. Hallelujah. So back over in Hebrews, so praise God. We were on verse, verse 11 or so, weren't we? Praise God, uh, Hebrews 9, 11, uh, 12, 13, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge? Now, when you purge something, you get rid of everything. Amen? When it's purged, it's cleansed. Amen? You, listen, here's the beautiful thing. He didn't purge or just cover or remove the sin from your flesh. He went to the place where sin takes root and hold and keeps you in captivity, and that is in your conscience. 
And he went to your conscience and purged it from your conscience. Amen. Now, you know, if you purge computer files or whatever, you... you <laughs> Hello? I had somebody call me one day and said, I don't want to be on your mailing list. I don't want to be on your phone list. I purged them. Then they called back later and said, I want to be on the list. <laughs> now, which is it? You know? <laughs> I love it when they call you and go, you taught us everything. We taught us our whole foundation. We just love you. You're great. Da, 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 da. And then they tell you where they're, they're somewhere else because whatever. Just don't patronize me. Anyway, get, I, I don't want to be on your mailing list. I don't want to receive anything else from you. Okay, you're purged. And they call you and say, well, why didn't, they, why didn't you send me and let me know about what was going on here? You asked me to remove you from the list. I purged you. Well, God comes to your sins and looks at them by the blood of Jesus and says, you're purged from grace conscience. Now Satan, ha see, you can with all legitimacy say, the man that did those things does not exist. That's right. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, you remember, uh, you remember when you did such and such back and such and such? Nope. nope. You're a liar. I'm the father of lies. I know it's somebody's lying. Nope. <laughs> you can't say that with a good... Oh, yes, I can. Because Jesus' blood purged my conscience Amen. from dead works. All those dead works have been purged. Amen. There's no recovery. And we, listen, there, there was a thing we used to do with, with uh, audio tape. We would have a, 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 a demagnetizer. I forgot what they called it. I guess it was a demagnetizer. You could, take a, you, know, you could take a tape and you record over it. But still in the background, some of that stuff was still there. But you take a demagnetizer, degausser. Is that what it is? Uh, degausser. And it wiped it out. It just scrambled all the electronic data on there and just <laughs> as blank as blank could be. There won't no recovery. Probably something on the, on the little, yeah, something similar to that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's what all the government people do when they come to get them for the, the cheating stuff they did. <laughs> because just, just deleting a file doesn't delete a file. <laughs> Ask Peter Norton. <laughs> oh, yeah. You see everybody would go out and buy Norton Utilities to recover that file they just deleted. <coughs> and all I did back then was they used to put a, an asterisk in front of the file name when it was d deleted. And it was still there until, they, until that actual segment got rewritten over. It was still there. And so you could take Norton Utilities and recover it. There's some men, if there were any file I recovered, how to, ooh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> anyway, your conscience, where Satan comes and accuses you. What's this got to do with overcoming? Every doggone thing. I said everything. Because if you do not have a pure or purged conscience before God when the enemy comes and starts accusing you he'll get you out of faith and when he gets you out of faith you can't win so you you won't have the testimony are you here are you here all right let's finish reading this um verse 15 and for this cause he is the mediator um that by the means of death for the redemption, not atonement, the redemption of the transgressors that were under the first testament or covenant that were called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither was the first testament was dedicated, I mean, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses has spoken every precept of the law, according, I mean, according, or, or, oh, when Moses has spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and, his, and sprinkled both the book and the people. So he's, he sprinkled the book? Why? Because it took blood to enforce that covenant. Beginning with Adam, we refer to it as the Adamic, Adamic covenant. That's when God slew the animals and covered them in their skins. Blood was shed to cover sin from the very beginning. It took, why? Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. It took innocent blood to cover the sin of man. And here, when they got to the covenant that God was giving Moses, they had to, cut, to sprinkle the book, what? To bring into force. This is very important. There's an allegory here, and it's in the New Testament for a reason. 
the book of the covenant was sprinkled in blood, ratifying its force as a blood covenant between God and man. And then the people were sprinkled. That they were in covenant with God in accordance with that. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> That's why I love this book. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Say, and then he said this. This is the blood of the covenant. Cat Testament can be refer, uh, translated covenant. Which God has enjoined unto you. God said, I'm in covenant with you. I've given my word, and it's a covenant word. Now, let me say something, folks. God took it so seriously, he made it a blood covenant. What does that mean? God don't lie. He, he put it in force as a covenant, sealed in blood. Moreover, he sprinkled the blood, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Listen to this next statement. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purged with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What are we referring back to? If the blood of bulls and of goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctified, I mean, to the unclean sanctified, to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? The earthly things were covered in the blood of goats and of bulls, and there was a strong covenant with God and man in sealed in the blood of animals. And it was necessary that the earthly things be done that way. But the heavenly things had to be done with something greater are you here? The only, <laughs> for Christ, verse 24, is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, they're allegories, or types, shadows, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet, yet should he have offered himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For he then must have often suffered since the foundation. In other words, in other words Jesus would have died every year and be raised up, die every year and be raised up, die every year and be raised up. But now, once in the end of the world, now, he's talking about the eighth. Understand that a lot of times when the word world is used in the New Testament, it's referring to age and not the planet. Okay? to the age we're in. Okay. Not actually physically, literally talking about the, the physical planet, but talking about the world age, this age, or uh, time, and sp time and space. Okay? Um, in the end of the world, end of the age, um, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered to bear the sins of many once, I'm sorry, was, was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Oh, glory to God. I said glory to God. Now think about it. Under the old covenant, remember, Hebrew says um, that these things were written as iron samples. Now, it's the only time that word is used in the King James, uh, in sample. It, just, it really probably means basically an example. But... The things that the Jews went through were written as iron sample. Here, he says, the, the, he's writing and says that everything in this earth, the thing had to be uh, sealed or sanctified, ratified in blood. Earthly blood, animals, so forth. Man needed eternal redemption. The heavenly, now if you understand this and study this out just a little bit, you'll figure this out. Now when they offered the blood, they, well, in, the, in the Holy of Holies, what was there? It was God's throne and the mercy seat, which was in front of the throne, and blood had to be put on mercy seat. Why? The holy, uh, earthly. The earthly Holy of Holies. We had, the, we had, the, we had the, the seat of God, and in front of that we had the mercy seat. Where, where all, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, I mean, and the, uh, the, uh, the tablets and all that in the, was in that. And blood had to be put on it. Why? It's a type of something. It's a type of the heavenly. There was no put blood put on the throne of God. Why was it put on the mercy seat? Because that's how far man's authority went. Man's authority went up to, but did not include, the throne of God. 
And when Adam committed high treason in the Garden of Eden, he turned his authority, which gave Satan that right to come all the way up to, but not include the throne of God, and accuse the brethren. That's why blood had to be put there. Because was it was tainted all the way up to there by man's sin. That's how far man's authority went. So when Jesus entered in, he had to go all the way to where sin had tainted heaven and cleanse it with his blood and take back man's authority. And he put it on the mercy seat of heaven. Hallelujah. And it was cleansed. You read what Job says, and uh, came the time of the year where, 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 where Satan came before the throne of God, and, you know, and the sons of God came before the throne, and then Satan began to accuse God about Job and that kind of stuff. How did he get there? How could he get there? He'd been cast out. Because man gave him the authority to get right there. When Adam sold out in the Garden of Eden, because that, that's where Adam's authority went. So when he sold out, Satan could go up there. And he couldn't rule heaven, but he could go there because Adam had given him the key. It's like, you know, it's like me having a lease somewhere and giving you a sublease and somebody coming, you can't be here. I'm sorry, I got, the, I got the lease. Somebody was turned over to me. Ain't nothing you can do about it until the lease runs out. <laughs> well, Jesus came and whooped him. <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah. I said, how, and then he went in with his own blood. Hallelujah. And he, now listen, he put it on the mercy seat of God. Now what happens? Well, according to the old covenant, the new covenant is now ratified in blood. We have a new and a better covenant established upon better promises. And it's covered in the blood. Hallelujah. What happened? When you, when, when, when you come to Jesus and accept his re re redemption, you're washed in the blood. And now we overcome. Why? Because the word of our testimony is the word of our covenant. And it's been sprinkled with blood. Not the blood of bulls and of goats, but the blood of Jesus Christ himself. And so this word now stands sure and stands steadfast and stands true because it's not just the word of a man. It's not just a, you know, a good idea. It is a covenant word. God has enjoined himself unto you through the blood of Jesus Christ and everything he said in this book is sealed and ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ himself. And he sits at the right hand of the Father as our advocate. He's our lawyer. And anybody says, you can't do that for him. Jesus said, my blood's ratified that word. He's taken the word of his testimony. See, this is how we overcome by the blood. It's ratified and sealed in the blood. Then our word of our testimony, now we speak. Now remember the word, we said this before in teaching on, on, on confession. The word uh, confess literally can mean in the Greek to covenant with or to say the same thing as. So our testimony is our covenant declaration and that covenant declaration that's why you got to speak the word you can't speak you know some i wish so hope so maybe so you can't speak something you just dream up you got to say what the word says you can't be confessing for somebody else's wife or somebody else's car just forget that junk say what the word says why because the word has been sprinkled with the, just like moses did took you know took the, the hyssop and they sprinkled the blood on the people and on the on the art on, on the covenant tables mm -hmm. and all the heavenly uh, uh, utensils of worship jesus went in with his own blood and he did all of that one time and a covenant was established a new and a better covenant on better promises and the blood of jesus how do you know because moses did it jesus had to do it it was a type of the things to come. Jesus did the same thing to the covenant between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and sprinkled that blood on that covenant. It's a blood covenant oath of God, his promises to you. So important to God that the blood of Jesus was used to ratify it, to put it in force. So now when you take that word in your mouth, and you speak it. You're not just quoting a scripture and trying to be cute. You are declaring the covenant oath of God to you into this realm. Sealed eternally by the blood of Jesus Christ himself. Whew. I'll make you dance. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
that make you hoop. <laughs> Glory to God. I meant you get, you know, I say, oh, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Ain't that right, Cook? It gets you going. <laughs> Think of that. This is how we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That blood. Oh, glory to God. They could take that covenant of the Old Testament and receive from God. God said they could. And it was sealed with blood, blood of bulls and of goats. Do you remember what Jesus told the ten lepers? They followed after him. He said, go show yourself to priests according to the law and, and take the sacrifice according to the law of Moses. And they were, they were healed as they went. Under the law of Moses, they could get healed. Now, one turned and came back and began to worship. He said, weren't there ten? Where are the nine? He said, I don't know. Now, listen, here's, the, here's the thing. Jesus said, go your way. Your faith made you whole, not healed. He, got, he had that country song going on. Got his nose back, his ears back, his first two fingers back. <laughs> he wasn't just healed, he was made whole. So all the things leprosy had rotted off of his body, he was restored whole by faith. And we, this is the reason we can have faith in the word of God because it was sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. God has enjoined this covenant unto you through the blood of Jesus. It is steadfast and sure. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Amen. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he uh, said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Amen. But why is that so true? People go, well, well, God's sovereign. He can do whatever He wants to do. He can't break covenant. He says He's the Lord and keepeth covenant to a thousand generations. Glory to God. God is not a covenant breaker. And the words that He spoke were sealed in blood as a covenant. See, people come along with a sovereign thing and get, God gets off the hook and gets blamed for everything because of sovereignty. But God's decreed He's not a man. He can't lie. God's not a covenant breaker. He keeps. He said, I keep covenant. <laughs> and we had this book. And it's full of all kinds of scriptures. All things that God spoke. And that was sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Not for an arbitrary annual covenant. But for an eternal redemption. So that means it doesn't matter if it's 2016 and it's 2000 and, you know, I mean, uh, uh, 1,087 years or whatever since it was written down. It doesn't matter if it's almost 2,000 years ago since it was recorded. It's eternal. And the blood of Jesus is still in force. And the blood of Jesus still holds it in force. And the blood of Jesus, glory to God, is the, the sure steadfast the surety to you that God will do what he said he would do because God can God thought it so important he enjoined yourself himself to you through this word sealed in the blood of Jesus it is a blood covenant oath to you well if we don't do our part he doesn't have to do what he said he would do did you ever read that scripture this is this a mess up some theology you know, if you do this, he'll do that. If you do this, you do that. He says, if, you're, if you don't abide faithful, yet he remaineth faithful. God can't break his word. <laughs> I said, God can't break his word. God's going to do what he said he would do. Hallelujah. Oh, my. You can see why this is my favorite book, passage in the Bible. <laughs> Hallelujah. I ain't preaching this a long time. I love to preach on the blood. Hallelujah. Uh, old Pentecostal start to come out. Uh, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Hebrews 10, and Romans 10, 8 and 10. What saith it? The word is nigh thee. This, this is why there's so much emphasis in the scripture put on speaking the word. Because there is a, there is a covenant. There is an oath of God to you that he sealed and ratified and covenanted with you through the blood of Jesus. And he wants you to take that 
and put it into your mouth and release its force into this realm. Yes. Yes. And by you speaking that oath, that covenant word in this body, you release its authority over your life and it's backed up by a word that's been sealed by the blood of Jesus. Thank you. Speak in tongues. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Think of it. So they get there in the book of Revelation. They say, well, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testament. See, they knew, they knew what they were talking about there. They understood it. They, understood, they could see all that word covered in the blood. They could see the covenant of God in force behind that. So that when the believer stands up and declares... I'm the healed of the Lord. Satan, you got to take your hand off my body in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Spiritual forces that are enforcing and bringing things against me, you must cease and desist. All of a sudden, there are angels out there <clears throat> who hear the covenant words of the Almighty being declared through the mouth of a, of a covenant partner with God, and they go into operation. They go into force. They go, into, they go to work. Why don't it happen right away? Ask Daniel. You know what the angel told him when he got there? I was sent three weeks ago. At your first word. But the prince of Persia withstood me. They were, he fought the prince of Persia for three weeks. Now I got news for you. It's not as difficult now because those forces have been conquered by Jesus. It's not a three week process anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Somebody shout, Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. The word is not even in thy mouth. There's your answer, praise God. You see, you got the blood. See, I grew up in a culture. We pleaded the blood. We plead the blood. We plead the blood. We're, we're, really, we're pleading our case based on the blood. That blood of Jesus is ratifying what I need. It's the ratification. It is the surety. It is the, it is the testimony to us that God has already had something to say about your circumstance. And when, what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that faith, the assurance, see, there's an assurance, there's a confident assurance. You have what you decree because when you decree the word, you are releasing the covenant oath of God that's backed up ratified, sealed by the blood of Jesus. God is enjoined to you in a covenant to fulfill his oath yeah. that you speak. Yeah. See, now all of a sudden, the word's not just words off a book. The word of God's a living thing because it is the oath of God himself. So important to him <laughs> Not only did he give it to you, he sealed it in his son's blood. As a blood covenant to you. <laughs> huh. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Glory to God. How strong is that covenant? And we overcome. So you'll leave here today. You'll never see your confession the same again. Your confession will never be the same again. Why won't it be the same? Because now you have a new perspective on it. When you take what God said, so 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. What? By whose stripes ye were, were. Isaiah says are. Future tense prophecy. Peter calls it past tense done, were healed. See, it's done. See, that's the oath. It's already been accomplished. Yeah, Isaiah says are done, are healed. Peter says we're healed. By his rights, we were healed. It's an accomplished fact. God's got a covenant word to you. you. You were healed. And he sealed it in blood. Now you ever, see, I'm telling you, you can't, ever, you can't ever think of confession and speaking the word the same again. Because I'm not just lip servicing some words out there. I'm taking into my mouth the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. I'm taking into my mouth the very oath of God to me. See, the words he spoke to us was a covenant oath. Uh, if you ever read the book, 
there are there are two books. There's a there's an original book by H. Clay Trumbull, written in the late 1800s concerning the travels of Stanley and Livingston, and the book is entitled The Blood Covenant. Now let me tell you, it, it is scholarly reading. I mean, it's just not it's just not a nighttime bedside read. You got You got to really get after it. I'm just saying. But he he goes and covers. Stanley and Livingston's travels across Africa and all the covenants they cut to survive. And, and they, would, they say, you know, the chief would come out sometime and they were going to cut a covenant so they could pass through this part of the country or whatever. And, uh, you know, and they would, they would just, you know, pronounce all the blessings on you or all the, the benefits of being in covenant with them. And then they would pronounce all the curses. And he says, there were some of those god-awful curses you've ever heard in your life if you broke the covenant. Now, they found out in traveling across Africa that many of the tribes, the covenant was so strong that if somebody broke it, the offended family, no, not the offended the offending family would hunt their own relatives down and kill them because they broke blood covenant. Now, this isn't because, now, <laughs> here, here's the thing. It's there because blood covenant started with God. These are remnants of how strong anciently blood covenant was taken because God had it so strong from him. And then E.W. Kenyon has a, a, a book, The Blood Covenant. He refers to the, the, the Trumbull book often in that little mini book. It's, it's, it's a bedside read. <laughs> Trumbull's is not. I, mean, I had to read it at Raymond and you're like, that's good stuff. Oh my God. <laughs> Scholarly stuff sometimes, you know, you, this written from a scholar standpoint or whatever, they can get really, you really got to keep your mind sharp, you know. Listen to the back, listen to uh, Pat Summerall on the 18th Green talking in the background. It's not what you want to be listening to when you're reading that book. <laughs> it's breaking right to left. Oh, he missed it. Praise God. Did y'all get anything out of this? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.